I want to welcome each of you to this joint West Wharf webcast, Co-Digestion of Organic Waste Products with Wastewater Solids, sponsored by JWC Environmental. Before we begin, I would like to quickly review a few logistics. All of the PDF PowerPoint presentations are available for downloading at West FTP link. This link was distributed via email yesterday and will be distributed again tomorrow for anyone that registered after the time of distribution. The FTP link for this webcast also has information on how to receive professional development hours for those eligible to receive these training credits. There are 1.5 PDH credits for this webcast. You will need to complete the evaluation form to receive the PDH certificate. Your feedback on this webcast is important and helps identify future webcast topics that are timely and helpful to you. Please follow the PDH instructions and check with your state accreditation agency on how to receive this credit. During this webcast, while you cannot speak directly to the presenters, you will, however, have an opportunity to submit questions by typing in your specific question via the pane that appears on your PC. Today's moderator, Lauren Fillmore, will be accumulating questions and direct them to the presenters throughout the webcast. We will be recording this webcast. A link will be sent to all registered users tomorrow so that you can share it with other colleagues who could not attend the webcast. If you have any additional questions after the webcast is ended, please email webcast with an S, at WEF.org. Uh, before we get started, I have a poll question for everyone. Let me go ahead and launch that. The question is, how many people are participating in the webcast today at your computer? Um, if you're participating by yourself, please respond one. If you're participating in a conference room, for example, um, please just do a quick head count. I'll just give that a few seconds for the votes to come in. Great. Thank you so much, everyone, for voting. Looks like we have 83% today uh, participating by themselves. So I'd like to thank uh, Lauren for moderating today's webcast. Lauren Fillmore is a Senior Program Director at the Water Environment Research, Fo Research Foundation. Lauren? Welcome, everybody. I'm going to be talking a little bit about the road to energy neutrality and how co-digestion of organic waste are a really important part of that road. Both my organization, WERF, and WEF have prepared um, energy roadmaps. One of the things that is common to both of these energy roadmaps is the importance of co-digestion and anaerobic, with anaerobic digestion of wastewater solids in reaching energy neutrality. In the wastewater sector, there are leaders, uh, wastewater facilities, and I've given some examples here, um, that we've looked at who've achieved net zero. One of the ones that my organization looked at several years ago was an international plant in, um, around the Innsbruck, um, Austria area, the Strauss plant. And some of you may have known that. Um, we did a case study on that, and we saw how they were able to achieve and actually produce more energy beyond the net zero. What we're going to talk about a little bit today are some of the examples closer to home. We have um, both Des Moines and Ithaca case studies that will be in this presentation. What I wanted to also mention that there has been a changing view of biosolids management that have really um, enabled a lot of the research that my organization does looking into energy recovery from biosolids. It is no longer a disposal option managing biosolids, but we now have the uh, potential to recover resources. My organization is funding research into energy production and efficiency, not just from biosolids, but from all different aspects of wastewater. Our objective is to enable wastewater facilities to become net energy neutral and to operate solely on the energy that's embedded in the wastewater, the solids, 
and in the flow. Um, I just want to go over briefly some of the research that we're doing before I go to our featured uh, presentations. The research that I'm highlighting is all related to enhancing anaerobic digestion. We're looking at methods to evaluate anaerobic digester performance by using acoustic Doppler um, technology, which is something that is uh, pioneering. We're also enhancing co-digestion uh, through a fairly large effort looking at and understanding the operational side effects and providing solutions to those side effects. We've just finished up some projects looking at the uh, reasons for uh, digester foaming. And we've also started a two-phased project looking at new ways to better and more cost-effectively remove siloxanes from biogas. So um, it's able to be used in combined heat and power equipment. We have a report that's out there. It's only a month or so old. But we're also looking at advancing uh, the study of the removal technologies and the uh, gels that might be more cost-effective alternatives to activated carbon. And again, uh, I'm mentioning this. If anybody has interest in following up on these projects, um, I think you'll find it related very much to ana enhancing anaerobic digestion. Again, um, just for summary, Summarizing before we move on, uh, it is indeed possible to become energy net neutral in the near future. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and just uh, quickly go to today's agenda, and we have our featured speakers. What I'm going to do is I'm going to be introducing each speaker right before their presentation. Let me start with Dave Parry. Uh, Dr. Perry is a senior vice president with CDM Smith, who's responsible for their wastewater and energy practice. Dave brings his 30 years experience in biosolids and energy recovery projects worldwide to work, where he is the principal investigator on our recently completed co-digestion project. Dr. Perry is also past chair of the Bioenergy Technology Subcommittee of West Residuals and Biosolids Committee. Dave, I'm turning this over to you. Thanks, Lawrence. Uh, I'll go through from uh, co-digestion from the lab to the pilot scale studies, and then just touch briefly on some of the full scale operations. Starting with, what are the drivers for co-digestion? Why are more and more treatment plants implementing co-digestion? Uh, one of the key things is, is energy is such a high cost for uh, treatment plants, and co-digestion, as Lauren mentioned, is one of the low-hanging fruits that, that can help a, a plant get to energy neutrality or even to positive power uh, resource recovery. The, uh, and many, uh, many facilities see it as just a good you know, way to be an environmental steward, and so that commitment to environmental stewardship. The, uh, we have some states that are uh, have aggressive diversion goals for their solid waste, even some uh, regulations forbidding uh, or phasing out organic waste in the landfill. So they need to go, those organic wastes need to go somewhere, and a, a good beneficial use of those is, is in the wastewater treatment. What are some of the barriers to, to accelerating the implementation of co-digestion? What, uh, what we're finding and seeing is that the, the same, notice what I just talked about is on some uh, solid waste side and then also the wastewater side and also involves energy. So there's a, there's a tremendous need to collaborate between different utilities uh, from, from the energy, solid waste to, to wastewater and hauling so that, that it needs that collaboration. And also it's, uh, in many cases, in most cases, other than fat, oils, and grease, the economics are marginal. It's, it's not always economical just to bring in the organic waste without getting a tipping fee. A tipping fee is required to be received by the wastewater agency in order to have it economical because of the high cost of downstream uh, handling of any residuals after digestion. And there's also the barrier of either unsupportive regulations, at least, the, or undeveloped. That the uh, some of the, uh, you know, the, the organic waste is handled uh, by some regulations through solid waste, others through uh, you know, EPA and the 503 regs, 
but there's certainly not a developed regulation that incentivizes uh, to do co-digestion. It's uh, so that's still developing. And then some wastewater operators would view it as a risk to their core business. What about the side streams that come from the digestion and, and the increase in that and if there's nutrient limits? So these are some of the, the barriers from the uh, to get from where we're current practice to get to the widespread application. Many are overcoming these barriers, but it's important I think, to know what the barriers are. And in addition, we, we've got things like uh, you know relatively low natural gas rates and in some cases low solid waste tipping fees. So it still just costs less to bring the organics to a landfill if they're not if it's not regulated against that. And and then the the other barriers are trucking of the organic waste to a treatment plant. There's few treatment plants that, that want to turn their treatment plant into a, a solid waste handling facility. So, you know, getting that engineered organic waste uh, sorted, et cetera, before it gets to, to the treatment plant. And then, of course, any of the residuals, the, the challenges that we all face on the marketability of the biosolids and the, the evolution that's going on there now. So we, we need visionary leaders to really overcome these barriers. And that's, that's what I find in common with those that are practicing co-digestion, that they, there's leadership there. It's not that the barriers aren't there. It's that there's leaders that see the vision, see the benefit, and work through to, to have it so it is economical, that it, they do collaborate with the other utilities. They work through the regulations, and they actually see how it can actually complement their, their core of business of, of wastewater and water reclamation. As part of a, a work a study that Lauren and I worked on, we looked at the different options for food waste management. And, and one of the reasons for this is we wanted to see where does co-digestion fit within these different options. And we started from you know a form of, of co-digestion being food waste disposers that convey the organic waste to the treatment plant to truck in uh, solids directly, more directly to the digester, or does it go to a material recovery facility, to a compost facility, or to a landfill? How does that all, how do they compare? How does co-digestion stack up to the other option? And there's a whole report on this and, and for all the, all the details, but some of the highlights of this evaluation from this comparison is that co-digestion using food waste disposers and the sewers had the lowest life cycle cost. The infrastructure was already in place. And you know, if particularly it was lowest life cycle cost even if we needed to add infrastructure to to, to handle the increase. But in many cases the, the capacity is there and so the the operating costs and, and capital costs were, were the were the lowest overall because it's a very uh, small amount of hands-on or labor required and using existing infrastructure. For the co-digestion of trucking in food waste, it had the lowest uh, environmental impact, particularly from the, the, we put everything into a CO2 equivalent emission. So, and, and it was also the, uh, the most energy efficient because unlike the, the food waste disposers, which you, you do get the energy benefit, but you also can can have the impact of the downstream from additional aeration demands on co-digestion the, the trucking, the, the energy of that food waste got directly to the anaerobic process and was a, definitely a net energy positive. What are the co-digestion components? And this, these come up from when we, when we look at economics and we look at just what is involved in co-digestion. So in addition to the wastewater sludge coming into to the anaerobic digesters, there's also the organic waste that needs to be separated, processed, and get the glass and plastics and cardboard, any of the contaminants out. And then that, that would then be fed to the digester. Well, one of the benefits is the biogas that can then be treated and used, whether it's power or feed to biomethane. Uh, but there's also the side stream from the, the, the watering of the uh, digested sludge. And that needs to be treated either in a side stream treatment or in the main uh, treatment. And then the solids further downstream biosolids processing, which 
uh, varies greatly from plant to plant. It's important to recognize the advantages and disadvantages of, of separate versus co-digestion. And what I mean here is that there are several facilities that are digesting organic waste not at a treatment plant, just putting in their own digesters and treating and digesting this. And that's what I'm referring to as separate digestion. We actually have there's another project I'm working on that we're demonstrating this at the Air Force Academy of just a standalone take food waste and food to fuel. But here, the, the difference, though, is when you do a separate facility, you need new digesters. You need biosolids, classes, all those components that components I just showed need to be provided, and none of them exist at, uh, as they would at a treatment plant. They need operation and maintenance staff. And then the, there's an insignificant heat and power demand on that separate, or at least just for there's not a, an opportunity to heat the rest of the plant or power. There, there's a net energy positive, so you're not offsetting or striving for that. It's very easy to get a separate digestion facility energy positive. But then to get the most value of that, that energy is, is a challenge. Where at a co-digestion at a wastewater treatment plant, most of the times you have existing facilities like the anaerobic digesters and biosolids processing, the biogas use, and the wastewater treatment. They're, they all exist, and there's existing O&M staff, and, and, and there's a significant heat and power uh, demand. Another uh, consideration is the compatibility of the different wastes. Uh, what we found in the research was that when food waste is digested individually, there actually can be a deficiency in micronutrients, uh, some key nutrients that are needed for digestion like the cobalt and nickel that we, we don't even think about in wastewater treatment plant and digestion because they're, they're adequate, plentiful, but they're, they can be deficient when it's food waste alone. And then they, the food waste can digest so well that there's minimum buffering capacity. The very few solids are left, and and, and just getting the, the alkalinity enough in the solids. Where when it when it's done in co-digestion, there's plenty of nutrients, plenty of buffer capacity, uh, and they complement each other. On the, the food waste separate, high volatile solids reduction, over 85 percent. We've seen this over 90 percent, and uh, relatively low in wastewater solids, but putting the two together, they complement each other. Uh, food waste can come in at greater than 20 percent solids. It, it, we've got a thick in wastewater solids. The food waste can bring a carbon source and, and can help balance and avoid ammonia toxicity in wastewater solids so we can, we can load digesters greater. So with this, the, the research objectives, and this is the, the re final report that Lauren mentioned that uh, is available on the work website. The, uh, the objectives of this research were the organic waste characterization, the organic waste compatibility, the operating parameters for reliable digestion operation, and the organic loading rates and the co-digestion economics. And all this associated with the underlying theme of, of moving towards that energy neutrality. So we started in the lab. We actually started in, in the literature search, et cetera, and doing some comprehensive waste characterization and biogas production. And then in the larger carboy uh, lab work, we did more acclimation and seeing the, the uh, effect of continual feeding of the digesters. And we took it to the pilot scale, and that's where we looked more at the percentages of, of what we could handle, and, and then looked at the overall evaluation of sustainable organic management that I, that I mentioned earlier. Most of you may, maybe have seen this before, just quantifying over the hours how much the addition, this is the additional gas that is produced from the, from the co-digestion. And only the, the grease showed a, an initial drop, but then it, it passed up all the others. But if there's, we did find, with, uh, particularly with the fats, oils, and grease, that a more susceptibility to, to upset a great energy source, even at the same COD loading, but a more uh, sensitive to the to the loading, and and you can see that there in the uh, in the grease plot where it actually a little le lower gas production at first, and then overtaking the others. 
On the pilot facility, one of the key objectives there that I mentioned was just how much fog can be added as a percent of the feed. And, and so you, you see this is just one of the plots, but we got all the way up to, to 60%. What I'm showing is average gas production rate and then the percent of COD loading to the test budget. So we got to 250%, which meant it was actually 60% fog being sent to that digester. Well, the, the control continued on, but you, you see the test where we stressed it, it kept going up, going up, and then it just plummeted. And that, that's where we, that was one of the indications of, of overload. But we got all the way to 60% of fat, soils, and grease as, as a percent of COD fed to the digester. So you can, you can load it at a high percent. You, we'd recommend loading less than that to keep stable, but uh, we were able to get it that high. A, a key development was the, uh, a new way to, to measure loading rates. With, with all the different wastes out there from the different solid concentrations, volatile solids, reduction rates, and the different energy strengths, or COD, of, of the waste, we found it extremely helpful and necessary to not just look at the tension time or volatile solid loading, but take into account the strength of the waste. We did that by COD as a surrogate for, for energy. And then to, to look at the digester and, 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 and accounting for the solids being loaded, look at the concentration of the volatile solids in the digester really as a, as a surrogate for the uh, microbes and, and methanogens that are there. So this is really a food to microorganism ratio for digesters. And, and the units are, that we are using now are kilograms of COD per day per gram of volatile solid in the digester. And so just simply put, where what we found is that you can load a higher volatile solid loading rate if you have a higher solid concentration in, in the feed, which translates to a higher percent solids in the digester, we found stable operation with a specific energy loading rate under 0.25 of pound COD per day per pound BS in, in the digester. We, we stress tested them higher, but that uh, for fat soils and grease and, and others, we, we were able to get to, to that high. And then it gives the same parameter throughout because it accounts for the, for the volatile solids in the digester. On the economics, this is also, we've got a nice spreadsheet in the report. This just shows some examples of the impact on, uh, on the tipping fee. So the, one of the key things that of interest for the economics is what tipping fee needs to be charged to, to break even. And, and it, the green shows food waste, the red dot shows fog. And, and then we showed cow manure just for comparison, cow manure being that it doesn't digest well, you get a lot of residuals. And then we showed some between new digesters or existing. So if you look at the food, you look, first look at the one that's negative. It's, this says that fat soils and grease, you could actually uh, pay to get them and, um, and benefit. It's where everything else, you need to charge a tipping fee. And you can charge a lower tipping fee uh, say the food waste used in the existing digest, if you have existing capacity in the digester. The, the graph that I show uh, is, is for new digester uh, capacity, and then it crosses the zero. If you're paying 20 cents a kilowatt hour, then the, you know, the, electric, the energy coming from that would then help, help you break even without even a tipping fee. Obviously, there's a lot of assumptions here to, to get a graph like this, because here's on the next Next graph shows the we fix the electric at 10 cents a kilowatt hour, but now we vary the cost of the residuals downstream of the digester. So putting dry tons per day, taking a, a $200 dry ton per day. That we saw facilities certainly less than that, others higher than that. But then again, you see as the cost of the residuals downstream, as that increases, the, the cost of the tipping fee uh, must increase. And so that's just another way to look at it. But the, the main takeaway from this is that typically tipping fees are required to, in order to break even. But then you, you can not, not only break even, you can um, have it a, a profitable or at least a, an, an operation that I think can cover the, the cost of the capital 
and and have it so it is an economical operation. With that, the uh, I think we're going to just do a couple of Q and A's in between, and then have more at the end. Yes, thank you, Dave. Um, I have a few questions. Um, we're going to limit it to three questions. So let me start with: um, Are grease separator contents similar to the fog that you characterized in this study? The uh, the fog. What we did to to standardize and to help everyone so they could use this data is that we we based everything on the COD loading of the fog. So we recognized that you know. Fog separation varies tremendously. We have saw that in our samples with the amount of water content in the fog. And, and so the only way that we felt that we could really present useful data to everyone was then to, to measure the, the COD of the, of the fog. So the, what we loaded there was uh, we standardized by a COD of the mixture, which uh, then if there was more or less water, uh, that, that's how you would relate this to whatever your fog separation and how much water is in your system. You, you would measure the, the equivalent, the COD of, of the solution that's being fed. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Uh, another question about the, uh, I guess it's the, uh, the lab um, graph where you're representing the different, um, um, I guess, uh, waste. Were those done by a single feed or a continuous feed? Those those were done. In that case was a single feed. The uh, and the uh, uh, and this measured over the time. So that's why you see it tapering off. Otherwise, it would just keep going off. So we we fed those to the more serum bottles and then measured it over the time with the respirometer and and so that that was a single feed. Okay, thank you. This is our last question for now, but please keep sending your questions in. We'll have another question and answer session at the end. Why did the fog, and I think this is the, the rate on the graph, decrease during the first phase of digestion? Yeah, the, there's some, it's really more of a theory to why it decreased. What we've what we found is that there's more of an inhibition to break down. The fog is, is more complex to break down. Uh, and and so it it takes longer to hydrolyze and to acidify, and and that that time as opposed to say simple carbohydrates or or others. So the uh, with that breakdown, it also uh, it appears to you know, you've got an inhibiting uh, situation that's going on there that it's taking longer to get it to. To the uh, to the methanogen to, to the gas production, and so at first it uh, it inhibits, and then as you as you can see it it it, uh, it increased and, and, and went further. We also uh, found that with putting in a uh, increasing by say 10 percent additional COD per per day loading of fog, we could upset a digester. We could have it go sour by you know, not only we would drop the gas production and, and go uh, get up upset, drop the CO, drop the methane, and increase the CO2 if we if we slug load of it. But if we gradually increase the say to that 10% increase, then we gradually increase gas production and did not upset. So the findings is, is that, as I mentioned, the susceptibility to the fog that it if it if it's slug loaded and and step fed like that, you're more it's more susceptible to upset the digest or see a drop in gas production before it comes back. So, you know, the ramping up of, of fog is is more important than than ramping up. Say the we didn't see that same inhibition when we fed in uh, produce or food waste that was more carbohydrate. Thank you very much, Dave. Thank you for answering the questions and, and for your presentation. I'm going to introduce our next speaker, who is Dustin Craig. He is an environmental engineer in the Kansas City office of CDM Smith. He focuses on bioenergy utilization studies and design at wastewater facilities. Dustin? 
Yes, thank you, Lauren. So today we're going to talk about a, a much larger program a facility at the Des Moines Wastewater Reclamation Facility. And uh, this is an aerial image of that facility, actually. So Des Moines WRF is a regional facility that treats all of the Des Moines area, uh, roughly half a million uh, people within that area. And it's a typical primary, secondary plant, um, average flows of around 60 MGD, uh, depending on the season. Uh, but one of the unique aspects and why we're talking about them is their hauled waste program. And they receive um, sometimes in excess of 50 trucks a day. Uh, we're talking the larger tanker, the 6,000-gallon tanker trucks coming into the facility, bringing in organic waste, um, with, which makes up as much as uh, 40 or 50 percent of their volatile solids loading to their anaerobic digestion. And these trucks come in from a variety of sources, uh, your traditional uh, fog, fats, oils, and greases from grease interceptors, um, some dairy waste, some animal processing waste, glycerin, uh, byproducts from ethanol production, and, and there's really a whole host of different organic waste coming in. All gets fed to their anaerobic digesters. They produce about 1.4 to as much as 1.9 million cubic feet a day of biogas. They use that for process heating, uh, building heating. They have some power gens and cogeneration, and they also sell some of that gas to an industrial user. So kind of talking about the evolution of this program, <clears throat> early on this picture on the left-hand side is, is their unloading facility. And around 1994, when they started experimenting, accepting in these wastes, and it's kind of a, a homemade system where they're taking off uh, uh, truckers and discharging that into an existed blended sludge well. And I think there was a lot of lessons learned on the feeding and the handling of these types of waste. Uh, one of the stories I heard was that they took in some hot waste, hot temperature waste, and they learned about the uh, ductility of PVC piping. When it gets too hot, it, it tends to sag you know, in between pipe support. So a whole lot of lessons learned during that phase. And around 2007 or so, uh, they implemented a, a much larger unloading facility. And this is, you can see a picture on the right, where they can take three tanker trucks um, and three different bays, and they discharge directly beneath. There's a below-grade holding tank uh, beneath these tanks. So they just discharge and hold that sludge, about 170,000 gallons, and then that gets bled in uh, slowly to their digesters, gets fed in with the, the primary sludge and the TWAS sludge. And this was a significant upgrade. Uh, they can, of course, accept more tanker trucks at the same time. Unloading was uh, much, much, much faster, and it allowed them a little bit of buffering so that they can control the feed into their digesters. One of the problems with that was they have this very large tank, and if they get debris or grit or things, it tends to settle out in that tank. And taking down that large 170,000 gallon tank was quite an endeavor. Uh, they'd have to contact all their haulers and say, you know, hold off, we, we, gotta, we can't accept anything, and it, cleaning it was a, a, a real nightmare. So our project in uh, 2009 or so installed these upstream settling boxes. And what they were is, is now the haulers are discharging into these connections right here. It's dropping into a small um, below-grade holding tank. And it allows anything to settle out. And then it overflows through a line into the much larger holding tank right adjacent to it. So that's that red arrow. It's, it's just overflowing by gravity into this large holding tank. And this really gave a spot that any grit or anything could settle out in these boxes. And it reduced the, the troublesome maintenance on the much larger tank uh, quite a bit. So one of the challenges with this waste is really how uh, variable it is. First of all, that you know, different loads are, have different characteristics. And you know, some loads are, are coming in uh, hot with high levels of volatiles. Some are a little bit lower. Um, and really the, the corrosive nature of this waste as well. And this picture on the lower right, this is on the fresh air inlet into this tank. And what happens is the vapors from this uh, waste come up this fresh air inlet, and then they'll uh, condense on the inside and then sort of drop back down. If you imagine like a candy cane, it's dropping back down on the opposite side. And you can see the ring of corrosion just from that vapor condensate kind of dropping down in that exact circular pattern on the top tank of the cover. So, very corrosive type waste. 
and it's always a challenge to deal with this. Um, and I'm not sure there's a, a, a right solution. One option is the HDPE or the PVC liners, um, which have been used successfully. Their Achilles heel is really the seams where they connect themselves and are, are butt welded. If those seams fail, then you can get material back behind that and kind of delaminate and, and come off. For these settling boxes, uh, we used a polymer precast concrete. And uh, this arrived to the site precast, and, and the binder, the, the corrosion is really inherent to the material so that you're not relying on that uh, interface between a liner and the existing or, or new concrete, that it's the, the corrosion protection is inherent to the actual structure itself. Of course, they cost uh, more money, and uh, you know, they're limited on the size on, that you can do on those types of boxes. One of the challenges is, is the debris that comes in from this type of waste as well. Uh, when we talked about our settling boxes before, there was a, a grate on them, a, a, a manual bar screen, and it's really shown here on the right. It's really just an FRP uh, grating um, that you put on an access platform, slid down in these channels. And our thought was that you know, we can screen out the floatables that will flow through there, and then we can periodically pull that and, and clean that off and prevent those floatables from getting downstream into the digesters and so forth. In reality, what happened is this blinded up within about two days. Um, and with all this debris, and, and it was you know, not easy to clean, not, nobody, not a fun job to clean, and, and we were all kind of really surprised at how much debris was in this material. So we've elected uh, those haven't been installed, and, and it's just flowing through into the larger holding tank. So those smaller boxes are really just operating as settling boxes and, and not screening boxes. So here's an aerial image of the Des Moines, their digester facility. They have six digesters, all roughly three million gallons. Um, they're in this horseshoe configuration. And uh, this is where the, in the upper areas where the hauled waste is dropped off. <clears throat> this is during construction when we're replacing the covers. So the existing facility had floating digesters, uh, floating covers. And this picture is a, a, a very extreme foam event, uh, probably the most extreme um, and 20 years of operations on these covers. So I don't want to uh, say this is typical of how they operated at all. But what happened was with this high organic loading and limited mixing on their existing digesters, they'd get foaming events, and that foam would bubble up along the annular space of the cover, get on top of the cover, weigh it down, and then more foam would kind of generate, um, and it, it kind of self-perpetuate uh, the problem. In this instance, there was actually a hole in the, the top cover, and sludge was getting down in that attic space and weighing it down even further. So this was a very bad day. Um, almost tipped the cover, but we're able to drain it back down and, and patch this cover and, and lived for another uh, two or three years. But when we went into our study, um, we looked at different cover op options. Um, of course, going back with the traditional fixed steel or floating steel, and a gas membrane cover, and then also the newer uh, type of cover, a submerged fixed concrete cover. <clears throat> and in the end, remember they had six digesters, we elected to install submerged fixed covers on five of those tanks and operate those as primaries. And the major reason was foam control, and as a bonus we get a, a little extra capacity because uh, those are actually operating in a submerged condition. And then on the secondary, we're going to operate one of these tanks as a secondary. That gets a gas membrane, uh, gives us a little bit of biogas gas storage, biosolid storage as well, and, and gives some flexibility on the dewatering operations. So here's a picture now of a finished submerged fixed cover. These are installed now on five of the primaries, and we're hoping to install that remaining gas membrane cover on the next uh, digester next week hopefully. And this is taken looking at two of the covers, and you can see uh, this is an older picture where the existing covers are back on the back digesters. Those have since been replaced with submerged fixed covers as well. So really a submerged fixed cover, it operates in a submerged condition. So this is a blow up of the gas dome, the very center of these covers. And 
when you're operating in a submerged condition, the downside is you pump one gallon in, one gallon overflows out to a standpipe, and you have to pump it to either dewatering or you know, a secondary digester in our case. But if you can imagine the way these di digesters operate and the benefit is you have gas forming throughout the entire digester contents bubbling up and then it comes up on the underside of the cover which is submerged. And it's the, there's a slight slope on that cover so there's a natural horizontal velocity towards the center of this gas dome. The gas is moving any foam or scum that would occur and bringing it to the center where we overflow off to a standpipe. We also have these recirculation where we can recirculate sludge through nozzles that come down and help to blast that foam and, and reintroduce it back into the rest of the sludge contents. So these covers are really mimicking an egg-shaped egg -shaped digester in a, a traditional um, digester configuration. So moving on to the mixing systems, uh, we evaluated the, the typical three, I guess the most common, um, gas bubble, mechanical draft tubes, and a pumped recirculation system. We did CFD modeling initially on these three options. Um, really what we found was that all three of these options work well and are used. We didn't really gain um, any particular insights on the CFD modeling on this portion other than showing the different velocities and, and coming up with these cool graphics. In the end, we selected uh, mechanical draft tubes for the primaries. There's five mixers per primary digester. And what we liked was the ability to mix from the top down so we can introduce or, or, or repump that top layer where we, we tend to form the, the foaming back into the rest of the digester contents and, and recirculate the mixer in that way. And in that way, we're not working against ourselves with the gas forming out. And then on the secondary digester, we went with the pumped recirculation system. It's uh, compatible with variable levels in, in your sludge levels within there. So after we had selected draft tubes um, on the primaries, we again turned to CFD modeling. And I think this is where it really, it really showed its value. And traditional MOP standards would say we needed the larger 36-inch diameter draft tubes uh, based on turnover time. And there's, of course, an added cost to that. And then we modeled these two options, either using the, the smaller 24-inch diameter draft tubes or the larger 36-inch. And what we found was that the 24-inch actually gave us better mixing um, throughout the entire digester. It had a, a higher average velocity throughout that entire digester. <clears throat> and the reason was it had a, a smaller pumping rate, but that pumping rate was coming out a smaller diameter draft tube at the end. So we kind of had this induced velocity that really helped to mix up the digester contents. So using this saved us you know, around $700,000 in capital with going these smaller diameter draft tubes. And we didn't lose anything. We, we still got um, really better mixing than we would have with the larger draft tubes. So this is a plot of the gas uh, usage at uh, Des Moines. And if you look at a couple things, the red is what is flared. The red is, is what they flared in, the, in 2007. You can see they're flaring uh, tremendous amount of gas, half a million cubic feet a day. And then this green comes on somewhere in May 2007 time frame, and that was the industrial user, which is right next to their facility, which takes the gas um, at a negotiated rate. And as soon as that come on, look how dramatically the flaring dropped. So that you know was naturally the payback to provide this additional gas usage um, this facility will gladly take the gas and use it in their process on a very large steam boiler. But one of the things we performed during the design is, is looking at this data set and trying to figure out how much storage uh, we should design for this facility. Um, and, and one of the things about the storage is if you think it's really useful in dampening, in dampening your production versus your usage. So, you may have a, a big spike in production when you feed in a high slug of, of organic waste. You want to store that little bit and then, and then ride out the, the, the dampening in the peaks that you have. Um, once you fill up your gas storage system and you can't store any more gas, it really doesn't have much value. So using this, the, the data set that we had, we went back in time and said, what if we had additional storage, different amounts? 
of gas storage, how would that have changed our the amount that we flared? Will we actually get a value of having as much as 800,000 cubic feet of storage? And you can see from um, our analysis that there really is very limited benefit. That once you fill up that storage system, you don't get any value from that, and you're not reducing the amount of gas that you're flaring. So there's there's really not that payback. So with that, I guess um, turn it over to questions if we have a couple questions. Sure. Thank you, Dustin. Uh, we do have quite a few questions, uh, but I'm going to have to limit them to three. Other folks may send in their questions, and we'll get to that during our question and answer session at the end. Okay. My first question for Dustin, does Des Moines have an ammonia limit on their discharge? Uh, yes, they do. Um, it's it be in the Midwest. It's not nearly as stringent as we see on the coast, on either coast. Um, you know, I don't I don't know that ammonia limit offhand, um, but that is certainly something that that comes into play when on these side streams coming back to their aeration basins. Uh, we did a, a process, an economic model that looked at you know, how much is the real cost of, of treating this waste and how much they charge for tipping fees and that was one of the inputs on what are we, what, what does it cost us to treat this pound of ammonia coming back to the, the secondary uh, of the process. So uh, they do have limits, I'm just not sure of them right now. Okay, thank you. Um, next question, what is the solids concentration that the digester operates at and how is the digester mixed? Okay, the, the second question, how is the digester mixed? These are now all five primaries in operation and all five are mixed with these draft tubes. So if you see from this picture in the foreground, this is one of the draft tubes. There's five uh, draft tubes per digester, four on the lower at each of the quadrants, about one third of the radius in, and there's one at the very center, which is up on top of the gas dome. You, you can't quite see it from this picture. but So those five draft tubes are what mix each of the primaries. The secondary digesters are mixed through a pumped recirculation system, a chopper pump, um, just pulling sludge off and recirculating through nozzles. And what was the first question? Um, it's about the solid uh, concentrations that the digester operates at. OK. Uh, it's really a kind of a traditional digester and that the feed is somewhere around 5% uh, plus or minus coming in and it operates um, between 25 to 3%, maybe as, as high as 3.5% at, at some times. So it's a, a more traditional uh, solids level within these digesters. Um, that was a, a two-part question, so I have one more. This is the, the final question. We'll save the rest for later on. What is the nature of the hauled waste, and does it include septage? Uh, the hauled waste does not include septage coming into the digesters. The facility does receive plenty of septage, and that goes back to the headworks. They have a different receiving facility um, over that, that treats that septage. And really, the, the nature of this hauled waste coming into the digesters is, is highly variable. It comes from you know, about 50 different sources. Uh, it ranges from dairy waste, um, animal processing waste. They receive a marigold extract from the processing of yellow dye. Um, they receive glycerin from biodiesel plants, some ethanol byproducts, uh, some traditional fog from uh, grease interceptors, uh, a whole host of organic um, waste. And it, it actually comes from all over the state of Iowa and even outside the state of Iowa. Uh, loads come in to, to be dealt here. So it's, it's really hard to characterize um, what exactly is coming in. It's just it's a variety of sports, sources. Um, it's really diverse. Thank you very much, Dustin. We're going to move on to our third speaker, Dan Raymer. Dan is a wastewater treatment plant operator, a sanitary engineer, and chief operator for 26 years at three municipalities in New York State. He's been with the Ithaca Area Wastewater Treatment Facility for the last five years. 
Dan graduated from SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry, followed by postgraduate research and teaching at Cornell University in the microbiology department, where he studied the bioenergetics of thermophilic methanogens. Dan, I'm turning this over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to provide a slightly contrasted view of things from, from Dustin's. We're a much smaller plant here in Ithaca. But it is kind of funny, as I was listening to Dustin's numbers, we're about one-tenth of the size of Des Moines. And we're producing about one-tenth of the amount of biogas. So I have a feeling our, our organic loadings are, are fairly similar. And um, from the photos, you can see me standing in front of a schematic of the treatment plant. And then to the right of that is our aerial view. Um, we're a very traditional activated sludge plant. Um, the one unique feature we have in the water treatment process is we use Kruger's ActiFlow for advanced phosphorus removal. Um, we discharge into Cuga Lake, which is part of the Finger Lakes, which actually flow north into Lake Ontario through um, a rather large river system. So we have been in the phosphorus removal business for a very long time and added the ActiFlow um, in the mid-2000s to anticipate changes in those regula regulations relative to phosphorus removal. Um, the main feature of this talk is in the immediate foreground to the left of the um, photo, the aerial photo, you will see a rather small square building um, at the front of that view, which is our trucked waste facility. Next to that, to the left, are our primary, followed by our secondary digesters. Um, this facility was blessed in the mid-80s in being built with a trucked waste receiving facility and very large digesters. Our digesters are a million four, a million five apiece. Um, and what I'm going to discuss today is our evolution um, through the co-digestion process and our new equipment and um, trucked waste facility. Um, first, uh, a little facility history with co-digestion. Our recent improvements in our digester and co-generation facilities that we um, facilitated with a performance contract. Our new trucked waste facility, which is actually in the final stages of being built. Um, uh, a discussion of our different substrates that we introduced for co-digestion. Our plans for incorporating food waste into our facility. Um, as well as a couple other little side projects I'll talk about, and then followed by our future uses of, of our biogas. Um, this, this shows our, uh, our old Caterpillar recip engine being removed as part of our project. Each of these cogens had over 100,000 hours on them and had done the yeoman's work for a long time. Um, fortunately for us, we were able to put them out on a surplus bid, and a farmer located about 20 miles away owned the exact same cat um, model and bought our two old ones. So they're actually still chugging away in some form or another um, as pieces parts at his farm. And again, to the right, I'll, uh, I already kind of covered it, but a, a couple arrows to show you the exact location if you missed it on the first slide. So I kind of like to think about this in a couple of different ways. I call it the co-digestion recipe, which you know um, was covered by Dave pretty well. And I just, in the second bullet there, you'll see some of our, uh, our carbon harvesting. Um, we take septic tank waste. We take grease trap waste. We've been getting some of the uh, Greek yogurt whey which is really nice stuff. Um, we get a rather unique material from Cornell's vet school that we call hydrolysate. It's a um, carcass digestion process that uses high strength um, potassium hydroxide and basically a pressure cooking autoclave device that circulates that until the carcass is completely digested into liquid and a small amount of what they call cremains. Um, kind of a neat process. Um, rather rather hard to, to take sometimes. 
but the material is great for the digester. And then we get some dairy processing plant sludges and a few other high strength wastes. We're working with the local airport. They've been trucking their material well over 100 miles and um, hopefully next year they'll be bringing that material to us. And then I, you know, the co-digestion equation here. Um, we, you add the residuals to your uh, trucked waste and you get a lot of biogas. Um, the key to this is a well-functioning digester that um, was kind of covered by Dustin and you need it well mixed and you need it well heated. And, you know, the big thing is, is we alter that carbon flow out of the greenhouse gas equation and sequester it within our biosolids and biogas, which, which adds to the community's um, lowering its impact of uh, greenhouse gas production. Adding food waste for us is kind of a no-brainer. Um, we have landfills located very far away, so the pressure for segregating organic materials from the garbage stream is ongoing. Um, there's also a rather large composting facility that is going to play a role in that, and hopefully we will as, as well. And then the big thing is, is you want to build your facilities to maximize this equation, um, and, and that's what I'm going to cover over the rest of the talk. So the first phase of our upgrades were done through a performance contract with Johnson Controls, included a lot of building envelope and HVAC stuff um, that's not really germane. But the big thing we did was we were able to solve a lot of infrastructure problems as well as upgrade our old equipment without adding to the debt service the whole purpose of a performance contract is you get to be a design build function and there's a guaranteed payback through the improvements. So Johnson Controls came in, did an audit, identified a bunch of facility improvement measures. We evaluated those measures and then turned it into a contract for building. And the list here on this slide are the highlights of that. We upgraded the digester mixing. We had to fix a imbalanced um, gas holding cover, so we, we fixed that problem. We installed some micro turbines to replace the recip engines you saw in the earlier photo. Um, we renovated the heat exchanging equipment and put it under a computer control system now and added a digester gas cleanup skid for the siloxane issues. And the last piece of this, which is due this summer, is we're going to lower our utilization through a new aeration system and blowers and DO control. Um, pretty standard recipe these days for um, energy improvements. Um, we went a slightly different way relative to the mixing. Um, we wanted to minimize the amount of horsepower. So we spent probably a good year and a half discussing um, different mixing options. And one of the ones that was emerging during our discussions was the um, linear motion mixer from Avivo. And I put a, a, an array of photos here to kind of show you the different components of, of how that device works. Um, in the left top, you will see all the components laying out on the, on the driveway as we were getting ready to uh, work with the crane and install it. Immediately to the right of that, you see the disc that is the mixer. It's a seven-foot diameter open-spoked disc that um, mixes a 85-foot diameter digester. And then to the right of that, you'll see a little um, sling that was the last of the grit we removed while cleaning the digester. Um, the left-hand lower corner photo shows the top of the mixing system. The shaft is coming through the blue seal tube. So this is how you seal the mixing shaft from the digester contents. Um, again, another shot of the disc floating through air so you kind of get a feel for how little material is involved in the disc and um, kind of makes you wonder how it's mixing. Um, and then finally, the, the main working unit is this Scotch yoke device which turns um, axial motion into linear motion and hence the name of the linear motion mixer. The mixer goes up and down 18 inches at about 30 beats per minute. And we run it continuously in our primary digester. We also installed one in our secondary digester. 
hoping that the future will bring us more stuff than we can treat with our primary, and we'll have to figure out ways of uh, redoing our secondary digestion system to uh, allow it to become a primary. And when we're cleaning the primary digester, the secondary digester becomes the primary digester. So it's real smart to have some mixing in there so you can keep um, maximizing your biogas. Um, the other piece of our project was biogas storage improvements. The photo on the left shows a welder installing the clips on the side of the gas holding cover to allow it to become a fixed cover. And then we see the rebar um, pad for the biogas um, dome that we're installing. And then the inner membrane is shown in the bottom photo. And then this next slide has a couple others. I wanted to show how it works a little bit. For those of you who haven't seen one of these, it's, it's kind of neat. The, the top left picture shows the inner membrane hanging from a spring. And the spring is connected to a load cell. And that is how the volume of the inner membrane is transmitted into your control system. So you actually get a 4 to 20 output that tells you exactly how much biogas is in there. and then. The outer membrane is shown, and the idea is, is that the air blower that you see on the pad blows air into the outer membrane and allows for a constant system pressure as the inner membrane expands and contracts. The void is then filled with air pressure. There's a couple of uh, air relief valves on the side of the outer membrane that then allow air to escape um, to keep a constant pressure, a relatively constant pressure on the system. Our biogas dome holds about 35,000 cubic feet of gas. And then the next piece of the puzzle that we added was this rather um, intimidating contraption that once you get to know it isn't so bad. This is our Unison gas cleanup skid. Um, basically, it's a dehumidifying system followed by a carbon tower, and the gas is compressed. And I show those features. The right-hand picture shows, well, the left-hand picture shows we were going to put it outside. Then we saw the heat tracing requirements, and we abandoned that. And the right-hand picture shows um, the air pads we used to float it in through a normal set of doors and set it into place inside our digester complex, which we are very glad we did, um, especially this winter. Our, our temperatures have been pretty low. The manufacturer themselves have basically um, built anything for northern climates now comes in an enclosure of some kind. And a lot of the ones they originally installed, I believe, have been retrofitted into buildings or retrofitted with, um, with weather-tight enclosures. Definitely a consideration in the northern climates. And then the last piece of, of this project, the big pieces, we, uh, we installed four microturbines. Um, we're capable of producing 240 kilowatts out of the four microturbines and about 1.2 to 1.6 million BTUs per hour of thermal um, capacity, which we used much like was described in the other, other talks. Um, we use it for building heat, digester heat, and um, the electricity is used all in-house. Last month, we... Um, at our peak biogas production in 28 days, we produced about 4 million cubic feet of gas and generated about 130,000 kilowatt hours of uh, electricity to use in the plant. So we're starting to realize some of our, um, our goals here. Um, now, as, as we fix the digesters, now we need to, uh, need to feed them. Um, and we are looking at our different treatment process residuals. You know, we generate about 14,000 pounds of solids. That's worth somewhere around 100,000 cubic feet per day of gas. And then we have just some rough numbers on some of the substrates I discussed earlier. The hydrolysate, one load of that's worth about 50,000 cubic feet of biogas. A tanker of whey is worth about 80,000 cubic feet of biogas. And then our septage, a typical load of septage or pump load of septage is probably worth around 30,000 cubic feet of biogas. That's probably the most variable number. Um, grease waste, I didn't have a good sample to analyze, um, so I don't know. We do take in 
a tremendous amount of grease trap waste from the commercial areas of Ithaca and um, the two colleges, especially Cornell University, has quite a bit of dining hall capacity up there. Um, this is a schematic of our new trucked waste facility. Um, the old facility encompassed a little bit more than the two tanks on the left-hand side of this schematic. We um, added a third tank and um, basically made a building around a tanker truck parked next to those three tanks. So we have greatly increased the size of our building. One of the things I didn't discuss in the aerial view is we are surrounded by valuable community access areas. Um, to, to the top of this photo is a waterfront trail that runs right along the edge of the dotted, line, the dotted um, shading. And then to the left of our treatment plant, we have a very large farmer's market. Um, so we are right in the heart of a public access area. So we wanted to make sure the beautiful, stinky stuff that we want to turn into energy is um, kept within our building and uh, within an odor control system. So that was a big consideration for us. Unlike the Des Moines facility, where things were open air, we want to keep everything closed up. Um, we did have one customer a few years ago that we had to cut off because the odors from the material um, transmitted right into the downtown area of Ithaca and uh, were quite objectionable. So our truck waste facility features, we added the new 20,000-gallon uh, storage tank to um, complement the existing, two existing 20,000-gallon tanks. Um, to the very left of that schematic facility um, earlier, we added a um, ground level offloading space for taking in food waste from small dump trucks. Our, um, our goal is Cornell University has about 750 tons of food waste that they're already segregating. We are going to experiment with that through this facility and learn what the limitations of food waste are. Um, we added a couple of JWC honey monsters for septage and grease screening and anything else we can run through it to get the garbage out. We are using the Vaughn chopper pump mixing system, which is very much like the digester mixing system, except we can either pump with it or we can mix with it in the tank. So I'll be able to grind and mix and move and get the garbage out of it, which is one of the key problems that we are going to have. And again, we want that indoor offloading so we can control odors. Um, this is a little before and after. You are seeing the old facility on the left coming down and the dust that it's generating. I, I, I like that shot. Um, that, was, that was a nice day. As we were tearing it down, we realized that none of the columns were connected to the concrete anymore. Everything had rusted away. Um, and to the right, not a very clear shot, but I wanted you to get a perspective. I am taking this photo from the waterfront trail that I mentioned earlier. And it did show to the left our biogas dome. And uh, in the middle is our primary digester. You can see the, the linear motion mixer sticking up off the top. And then to the right, the whole length of the building line is shown. And the, the um, translucent panels we put in to bring in natural light as well, trying to, trying to make a nice facility. And this is the construction um, phase of the project. Um, a variety of photos, uh, the new tank going in. Um, one, of the, one of the challenges we had with, with here is um, we had to deal with a lot of different earth situations that I'll cover in a moment. In the middle photo on top, you're starting to see the, the structure go up. And um, the, the next, you see the high bay area and the low bay area in the two bottom photos and the type of steel building and galvanized steel frame we're using to hopefully um, prevent any serious corrosion in there. And we're putting in a very advanced HVAC system as well. Some of the project challenges, um, I mentioned one, we're located right in the middle of this public access area of the farmer's market and waterfront trail. But the big one was we're a manufactured gas plant site um, from the 1920s. Um, so we have a lot of soils contaminated with um, creosote and other um, features of an oil crack natural gas facility before um, the Gulf Coast natural gas was shunted up through the, to the northeast. All these communities up here had 
uh, manufactured gas plants from coal or oil. There's a lot of cleanup involved with that. And the, actually, the hardest part of the whole project was continuing service throughout the project. A um, lot, of, lot of hose running around the ground and a, a lot of effort from my operators dealing with um, raking the residuals and, and other things out of the material. It's been, it's been a long process. So now a little summary. Um, we have a 25-year history with co-digestion, mostly with grease and um, septage. Um, we are looking to enhance that function and continue it. Um, the big one is we're going to be working with um, Cornell for the next, hopefully as soon as our facility is built here in another month, with their food waste, um, hopefully taking in three to five tons a day during the week and learning how to move the material. Um, we're hoping to, we have a grant with DEC right now that we're hoping to win an application in for building a vehicle fueling site here, which requires quite the compressor to separate the carbon dioxide from the, um, from the methane so that you can get up into that 90 to 95 percent pure methane range that's required to uh, use it as a secondary vehicle so fueling source. Um, some of the other future plans we have before I get to questions here, um, is, is we're working with a new company that has come up with a different way of uh, making primary treatment solids. Basically, they, they have a technology that can double the primary removal. And we've just um, secured an ICERTA grant that we're actually starting up this week to do uh, pilot scale anaerobic digestibility comparison to of normal treatment plant residuals with this um, technology generated residuals to sh see how to do a proper life cycle analysis if you were a treatment plant evaluating different primary treatment technologies. So we're, we're still trying to stay on the cutting edge of, of what's next as well and hopefully um, continuing our, our knowledge base as well. And with that, I'll uh, turn it over to some questions. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, let me start with the first question. Um, how do you manage the quality of the hauled waste? Yeah, um, we don't. Uh, we manage how we pump it into the digesters, I think, is, is the best thing. And, and really, we manage it on the digester side. We, we make sure we provided the absolute best um, environment for those microorganisms through our mixing and heating. and we try to understand our basic loads by doing COD analyses in the lab and applying that knowledge to when we have X, Y, and Z mixed in a tank, how fast or how much do we pump um, into the digesters. Okay, thank you. The next question, what is the pH of the carcass um, hydrolysate? It's, a, it's actually, a P, we make them reduce the pH so that it's not hazardous waste. We, we generally get it around 11 to 11 and a half um, standard units. And this is, uh, Dan, this will be your last question before we um, move on to the general question and answer part and to our sponsor. Okay, the airport, uh, the icing fluid that you mentioned you are going to accept, did you pilot test this material in your digesters? Now that's our next phase of that acceptance. Um, we just did some COD analyses. This, this conversation about taking the glycol just started within the last couple months. Um, we just got some COD data from that material and they're going to bring me a tanker. And my idea now is that I'll blend it with some septage slowly. So I'll use like my third tank as a holding tank and then pump a thousand or two thousand gallons into a load of septage or a load of grease to uh, buffer it a little bit. The CODs out of the lab on the glycol were nearly half a million parts. So yeah, there's definitely uh, concern in dealing with the glycol, but it is, um, that's kind of like sugar to the, to the uh, methanogens. Um, glycol is like glycerin. It, it really should have a, a big biogas boost as long as we, uh, are careful to feed the bugs, you know, don't try and jam too much down their throats. Okay, thank you very much, Dan. Now we're going to have a brief presentation from our sponsor, 
Alec Mackey is the marketing manager for equipment maker JWC Environmental. Over to you, Alec. Uh, thanks, Lauren. Um, I'm going to describe in just a couple minutes uh, JWC's clean and reliable grease and food waste receiving systems. But most importantly, as you've heard throughout the presentation, I want to urge people do a little more research. Let's put a little more care when we're designing these receiving stations. I've talked to dozens of grease receiving sites, and some of the homemade or the less expensive solutions are turning into real nightmares for the operators with smells, clogs, and painful cleanups. So JWC's focus is really on building strong machinery that can stand up to whatever is in that grease. Next slide. So why specify JWC? Um, Number one is reliability. Muffin monsters generate, you know, as you know, a couple tons of cutting force at peak load to slice through that tough debris, protects the pumps and systems, and it'll shred quietly and reliably for years. So it's stronger than those high-speed macerators. Operators will thank you for specking the muffin monster. Next, next slide. The second reason, we really focus on cleanliness. JWBC builds receiving stations that are fully automated, clean, and reliable, like this pair of Honey Monster septage receiving stations. We believe in building systems you don't have to worry about. Next slide. So here are our grease systems. This first one is the Honey Monster, and this particular one is the largest we've ever built, fully automated grease receiving system. It'll receive a dozen or more trucks per day. Left to right, you're looking at a rock trap, shredder, auger screen, and fully integrated washing and compacting. So why the grinder? It breaks up material and trash. It homogenizes the grease and makes it easier for the wash system to clean that grease off the plastic and trash as the auger screen is removing it. We do use a hot water spray wash system to keep things moving and to keep it clean. This was designed in partnership with our friends at CDM Smith. Next slide. Also with this system comes an automated billing and access control. Truck drivers simply slide their card to activate all the grinders and screens and receiving systems. After they're done, this will print a receipt for them, and it records the total gallons. And that data can be sent to the central office. Next slide. Our second system is a small, heavy object trap with a static screen. So this is about six trucks per day, maybe a bit more. This is a proprietary system. It builds a mat to capture more silverware, towels, and plastics, but it will not clog as it's receiving the grease. It also uses a hot water spray wash system, again, to keep things clean, to keep it flowing, to clean that trash that, uh, that we're collecting inside there. And it has an easy to empty capture basket. Next slide. So just a few of our sites, this one in Indiana. Again, the, the um, heavy object trap there has adjustable spacings, half inch to one inch. In the background, you'll see our Macha Monster shredder. There's a guy standing on a yellow platform. That's pulp food waste coming from Purdue University. It's delivered, and the macho shreds it to expose more surface area, area, and it also grinds up any napkins, towels, or silverware that may get in there. Next slide. This is a, a large project that we're building here in California. We're putting uh, 15 muffin monsters and two grease receiving systems into this resource recovery plant, again, you'll notice reliability, redundancy, and clean operations are important for all resource recovery plants. Next slide. I forgot to mention that California project is by Black & Veatch. In this picture, Muffin Monster is in a grease recirculation line. This receiving station was designed by Parsons. Note the pipeline insulation. You're going to want to keep that grease nice and warm so it keeps flowing. Next slide. And this is a Secondary muffin monster in a grease receiving process, the Corolo design. Remember to check the pH of the grease in your area. If you have a really high pH, we can offer stainless steel cutters and some other options, as well as the other pump and system manufacturers, valves and so on, that can stand up to the uh, high pH that you may see. Next slide. So that's it. With a clean, reliable receiving station, everybody wins. Management and engineers are happy with the revenue and operators enjoy managing a much cleaner receiving station. If you want to look under the hood of any of these systems, please contact your local JWC rep. We have a rep in almost every state. Thanks again for the opportunity, and back to you, Lauren.
Thank you, Alec. Now we're going to go ahead and uh, we have some questions here. I'm going to uh, first start with, I think, general questions. Um, can we estimate how many wastewater treatment plants in the USA are now co-digesting? Anybody want to give it a shot? I guess not. Well, this is Dave. I'll, uh, it's an excellent question, and, and you know, we, we've got tables and lists of those that are doing code generation, et cetera. I would, uh, I would, I would venture to guess that it, it's, it's in the magnitude of uh, 30 to, to 50 or, or so. The, uh, but it's just a guess. I have not quantified them, and that's just going on my my experience on, on, on different uh, facilities. There's some that are very pronounced, like the Des Moines, like East Bay Mud, like uh, SBSA, uh, but there's other there's, there's there's several others, you know, at Ithaca, and, you, you, and then others that are about to start up, and, and they're looking at it. So I would, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say in that kind of 30 to 50 range of some form, the fats, oils, and grease are the most pronounced. And then there's a smaller number that, that take in the food waste and, and, and are others. Thank you, Dave. Um, someone wants to know what the dollars per gallon or per ton um, in general are to process the outside organic material in any of these um, anaerobic digester plants. The, um, well, I I can certainly answer that again. The, the 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 graphs I showed in a dry ton basis can be converted to a per gallon basis depending on the concentration, the amount amount of water. So the uh, and, and 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 that's that's commonly you know converted to that. I use dry ton because of the fact that there's so many different characteristics that it, it it's a more common. Uh, it, it's a great way to state a cost, and then because the, the, it's not the water that that, take, that is the cost; it's more the solids and from that. But uh, so if you look at uh, you look at a typical uh, ten cents a kilowatt hour plus or minus, and uh, and then the cost of residual treatment, uh, a tipping fee will tend to be about. Uh, you know, a hundred dollars uh, per dry ton is, uh, and so that on a wet ton basis, if it's uh, you know coming in at, at, at say ten percent, then you you've got a you've got a fraction. You've got ten dollars a wet ton if it's ten percent solids, for example. And then you can, you can vary that uh, throughout. Some will go down right on to uh, ten eleven cents per gallon, and and then again, it, it matters whether it's a fats, oils, and grease that has the key part of that economic is not only the downstream residual and the electric rates, but also how much of that bulk of the solids will convert. And that's that's why fats, oils, and grease uh, you can accept with with the lower tipping fee or even with no tipping fee, because there's essentially no residual after that. So we're that, that's the key, and even if you take a highly volatile solid that, that digests where like food waste of 80 to 90 percent volatiles and 80 to 90 percent volatile solids destruction, you can still have a 25 percent of the initial solids coming in as residuals, and so that you know that that alone, if if, if your downstream costs are say a uh, hundred dollars. A dry ton. Well, you you better charge you know twenty five dollars a dry ton to, to bring it in because that's that's what it's costing you for the residual that just to go through it of a if you've got a seventy five percent reduction and twenty five percent of that remaining that's that's what it's costing just for the downstream treatment alone. So that that's where the I, I refer and uh, you know, that that's why we put a spreadsheet in to the uh, report that. Uh, the work report on this. It has the economics. It's set up to put uh, 
uh, the different costs in and then see what that tipping fee would be. And then you can convert from dry tons to the gallons to any any units that you'd like. This is Dan from Ithaca. Um, we charge between three and five cents a gallon um, for the ver different high strength waste that we get. The only one that's different is the hydrolysate. Um, Cornell's my largest normal sewer user, so it seems unfair for me to go out and gouge them like they're an outsider. So I give them a preferred rate for the hydrolysate. Okay, thank you. What is the best way to identify off-site waste streams and secure them um, for your wastewater plant? And what measures should be put in place to assure quality and that the characteristics are suitable in these uh, waste streams? I, I can tell you what we do here in Ithaca. We, um, one, we make them prove it's non-hazardous um, unless it's coming from like the, the yogurt way because they already go through a certification program. I don't do a lot with that material. Um, we do CODs in the lab, so we understand what the material is. And, you know, we try and look for stuff that's uniquely local um, and go after that. And then, you know, you, you kind of open up your doors and, and, you know, see how much you can handle in your digester and start looking around. Um, the, one of our dairy sludges comes from 100 miles away. The yogurt way comes from over three hours away. So there, there's some unique stuff out there. I think um, Dustin from, from Des Moines mentioned, you know, some rather unique substrates too. So, you know, really the first thing to do is to understand what you can handle and then start looking at what's a little bit unique locally that you can help solve a problem for an industry in particular, a still bottom, if you're in an area with a distillery, um, beer waste, you know, anything like that. You kind of you kind of cast yourself about to, to see what organic carbon is out there. Yeah, and I can uh, add on to that. In Des Moines, they have a citywide ordinance that the, um, you know, each sewer line from the restaurant <clears throat> is required to have a grease interceptor and that that waste has to be cleaned, um, I believe it's every six months or so, and further that that waste has to come to the De Des Moines uh, wastewater reclamation facility. So the ordinance requires them to bring it in. Some of the other uh, more unique <coughs> wastes I think were kind of identified as part of their pretreatment uh, program, going out to these facilities and doing inspections. Um, when they go to talk to a new facility about bringing in waste, they go and visit that facility and learn what their process is and what would be coming to them, and then they, you know, do some trial runs to make sure that they're not receiving anything that's toxic. Um, they do periodic spot sampling just to understand what's coming in from the different waste and make sure that it's classified. Uh, it is what they think it is, and, and typically the industry has to pay for each of those specific samples. Okay, thank you. Um, one more question. What's the footprint requirement for a waste receiving station? I think that'll depend on, uh, on how big your treatment plan. I think you kind of back it out the other way. You figure out what your digester can probably handle and then start looking at different substrates out there and the liquid volumes that would contain them and kind of back your way into, well, I better have so much storage. I mean, that's why we added our third storage tank. You know, I want to be able to segregate some of the high-strength stuff so that when I get to the weekend and the truck waste isn't as busy for us then, I'll have some high-strength waste that hopefully will be stored that I can pump into the digester to flatten out my gas production and keep my cogens up. And that's one of the considerations we had after 20-some years of experience. We added that extra tank in and the food waste tank. And, you know, for us, the big consideration were odors. So then we started looking at the building based on, you know, an 8,000-gallon tanker. Can it fit and close the doors? And that's how we sized our, our new facility. Yeah, that, that's consistent with the design considerations that others. You look at 
you know, how many trucks do you want to handle at one time? You, you saw Dustin on, on presentation on Des Moines going from one truck to, to three. I mean, that has footprint ramifications. And then exactly what Dan said on the on the storage tank. The key consideration is the feeding of the digester and the amount of storage. Thinking in terms of the amount of trucks coming in and the loading, the, the feeding to the digester, and then think of of the uh, uh, things like the weekend. Uh, you certainly want the the capacity for to bring in a day's worth of, uh, uh, of trucking and and then meter that into the digester and then thinking through on on, on that. So that that tankage and the number of trucks is uh, the key key considerations for the footprint. Okay, this is our last question. How does the high strength waste affect solids dewatering? Uh, and, yeah, go ahead. Um, you know, we, we've been adding the way into two different digesters in a way. Um, our, we started getting it before we did the mixing improvements and then afterwards. And we've really seen no change in the dewatering. The biggest change we've seen in our dewatering is our um, secondary solids are a little lighter now because we're mixing so much better. And so I think that's the only change we've seen. But it certainly hasn't gotten any harder with the introduction of the whey and the hydrolysate, two very different um, spectrums. One is very acidic. The other is very basic. And they're both really high strength. And we haven't had a lot of problems because of that. So I'm not sure. I think the big thing is, is again, you come back to your fundamental heating and mixing issues. Are, are the, if they're working great, you can generally understand what the impact of the substrate is and control how it dewaters. And I, I think the there's also that's an area of research for to get it to, to analyze the dewaterability of multiple types of waste. And as we get higher and higher percentages, I think part of it we're, we we would not see as much of an impact on dewatering when it's a fraction of the overall solid being sent. Or if there's very little residuals, I mean the the, the whey and the fat soils and grease. There's a high amount of their organics that are digested, to where if we if the organic waste had more residual, more fibrous material, like to take an extreme, if you took in uh, cow manure, which is very fibrous, and you're lucky if you get 30 or 40 percent of the volatiles to digest, that would have a significant impact. On, on the dewatering. Well, fat soils and grease, no residual. Um, you know, I wouldn't expect, uh, and we, we haven't seen the, the, the change in, in uh, dewaterability. But uh, that, that's, it's an excellent question. I think that's where additional research is needed as we get higher and higher percentages of the feed to the digesters being different organic waste that are of different characteristics than the uh, than the typical wastewater sludges. Thank you. And I want to thank our three speakers, Dave, Dustin, and Dan. And I want to thank all of you participants for joining us in this webcast. The organizer has ended the session, and this call will be disconnected. Goodbye.